Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very delighted to be here today and to be moderating this panel. And today we're looking at the transformation of the African live music industry. And uh, we've had brief introductions here with my panelists today. Maybe just a quick uh, uh, note of where we're actually all from around the region. Um, Rashid, I know you all know, he just finished his presentation. Um, uh, Dudu is from Senegal, and uh, you are the founder of the uh, Music Expo in Dakar. Uh, Walter is from Zimbabwe, and he is also the founder of the Jacaranda Festival. And uh, Morena, am I saying it right? More is from Mozambique, and he is a notable musician, composer, and producer from Mozambique. And I am myself from Tanzania. So I think we have a nice uh, description of people from the region, so hopefully we can benefit from this conversation. Um, maybe we can start by giving you all 30 seconds just to um, introduce yourselves. Maybe there's something that you would like to tell the audience. Uh, starting maybe, well, Rashad, I mean, Rashid, Rashid sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I am Rashid. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've done, 50, I said earlier, 15 years of jazz festival, but also looking where the world is going with major events and small events. And I think, you know, again, this presentation is quite a challenge to, to Africa as a whole, um, how we now recover and go back to, to um, the whole job creation. Am I going off the subject? But I think, you know, certainly the, it has affected our sector, the live music sector, tremendously. You know, loss of people, the suicide rate has, has risen. Musicians have lost homes, can't pay school fees. The, the, the support structures around the live performance, it's all, it, 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 it just ended. And, and we're in a very, very serious position. But coming back to, to me, you know, the company I started, uh, um, it, was, it was beautiful rock and roll. But I've also decided that there's so much knowledge I need to chill, but that I've got that I need to impart with others. So I've been working with people in... In, in, in Mozambique, in, uh, in Nigeria, and in Angola, and, uh, and passing knowledge to younger producers, promoters, especially in the area of administration, because we have enough technical people and musicians and that aspect, but technically running it, sustaining it, making money, because that's what we are about as well, business people. Yeah, that's what I do. Sorry. Thank you. And uh, maybe, Dudu, you can tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the discussion. Sure. Thank you, um, Aziza. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good. So the rain didn't dampen our spirits last night. Um, Dudu Sa from Dakar, West Africa, Senegal, the Francophone side of this continent. Um, about 25 years in the music industry, most of it spent alongside my big brother, Yusundur, who I think the last trip I was on this country was playing at Rashid's Festival in Cape Town. Um, so I've been working with him for the last, well, we've been together for quite some time, but I've been managing Yusu for 12 years now. So I must be doing something right <laughs> to be able to stand for 12 years. And then in the last three years, I had this mad, mad idea just before COVID to start my own festival and music conference similar to Access. Access is a big brother, and Dakar Music Expo is a younger brother of Access, which takes place in Senegal once a year, normally in February, but last time, last year we did it in June because of COVID. Um, and we're coming back in February from the 3rd to the 6th. So all of you guys are invited to Dakar, West Africa in February, I, and I hope to see you. So that's a bit about me. Thank you. Thank you. Can move on to Moreno. Hi, my name is Moreno Shongisa, and uh, Rashid comes to play. You spoke about Rashid. I think the first festival I played in my life, like bigger than, than life, Rashid took us there, the North Sea Jazz Festival. So then a few years later, they found Cape Town International. I wanted just to add that I'm also the creator and the founder of the More Jazz 
series. It's a jazz festival in Mozambique that has been converted into the Maputo International Jazz Festival. So, and I think I'm very privileged African because I live 19 years in Cape Town. Now I'm back in Mozambique. So I feel and understand the social dynamics of our business from both sides that are completely different. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Walter. Thank you. Um, my name is Walter Wanyanya. Um, I feel like I'm kind of, you know, the younger version of my brother. <laughs> I, I always call him my big brother. I kind of have the same um, history or uh, trajectory in, in entertainment. So I was managing Dr. or still manage um, his, uh, his late now, Dr. Oliver Mtukudzi's um, business, so I was his manager for the last five years of his life up until he passed away. Um, so I still manage his portfolio and everything that has to do with Tuku Music in Zimbabwe. Um, the founder of Jagaranda Music Festival in Harare, which happens every October, and also Jabulani Jazz Festival, which happens every April. Um, but yeah, it's an honor to be here, and uh, also, you know, it's good to be on the same panel with uh, Mr. Rashid. I was introduced to him by Bra Huma Sekela at the Huma Sekela Jazz Heritage uh, Festival, uh, I think about five, five years ago. So we attend. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really good to be here. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. And maybe just a note for the audience, uh, if you have any pending questions throughout the discussion, just make note of them and we'll come back to them in the end. So we'll move on to our very first question. Um, which I will prob probably direct to all of us, if we could give, maybe not so much uh, Rashid, because you already had a chance to talk about the situation here locally, but to some of us that come from different parts of the region, just a general overview of the situation of the creative and music industry um, as players post-COVID, or I shouldn't say post, because we're actually still in the thick of it. Um, to get a general feel of what's happening around the region. We can start off with you. Okay, well, um, in Senegal, um, I think it's pretty much the same as anywhere else with, when it comes to live music. We've had periods of you know, lockdown where um, hardly any live music gig took place in the country, and that's, that was the case until recently. Um, in our case, in the case of Yusu, he hasn't performed for the last two years in Senegal. That doesn't mean to say that there weren't any concerts. In fact, I mean, in the last two, three months, we've had, you know, all the restaurants, the usual circuit in Senegal has had all concerts and much, you know, relief to the musicians who haven't been able to, to, to be out for quite some time. Um, but as far as, well, you know, Yusu Nur, I mean, I also look after Orchestra Baobab as well. They've been more busy. They've been playing pretty much every Friday, Saturday, Sunday in the last three months. But overall, I think, you know, like anywhere else in the world, Senegal has been very badly affected by this pandemic. I think, you know, the entertainment industry is probably one of the worst hit sectors by the pandemic. Hopefully, you know, there's talk of this new variant, so God forbid that this creates, you know, wreaks havoc in and around the world, but um, you know, we've, we've announced our first gig on the 5th of December, and I hope we will get to do that. Um, so we'll see, fingers crossed, but you know, um, let's go and find those scientists with a you know, cure, <laughs> I'd say, but yeah, I mean, I've, the, just the word COVID, man, you know, make me to, so yeah, very badly, very severely affected the industry, I, I think right across the board, and Senegal is no exception. So. And uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of insight if the same is happening in Mozambique. Um, <laughs> I'm going to sound repetitive because it's the same, but it's important to understand that uh, the social dynamics of, of the SADC bloc and the West Africa, uh, although we are the same, uh, they're very different. Let me, let me speak about Mozambique and South Africa. The creative industry in Mozambique is subsidized, it's not self-sustainable, it's subsidized by who? By the telecommunications companies, the Vodacoms themselves, the Movitels, that put up the concerts, then banks, okay? So, you, and uh, 
there is a new trend that came in the last five, six years for the new generation of artists. You know? The pop Mozambican population from zero to 35 mm -hmm. years is, represents almost 40%. So the artists really survive from playing weddings. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. The more, like I would say, the quiet or the house music, it's weddings. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying the dynamics of the industry are, are a bit different, okay? So now, when COVID came, Mozambique wasn't aff affected by COVID immediately. Of course, it was coming. So we always have a decree, of, a presidential decree that in South Africa. And uh, now the last one was done on the 25th of October, where the president allowed for music venues, museums, uh, movie theaters, and performances for up to 40% capacity of the room. Rashid was mentioning here yeah, about 2,000 people outdoor mm -hmm. and uh, 500 indoor. That won't happen. But we have one thing that attracts, and which is our beaches. We have a long coastal line. And this long coastal line is a big asset for the creative and music industry. But the president opened on the 25th of, of October. Two weeks later, he had to close. <laughs> because that, that is a big problem. People go to the beach, yes, you have a concert, but you know, so you had to close. So, and that automatically, when you close the beach, you kill <laughs> everything. So now, I hear rumors, because December is coming, as you said, the fourth wave, probably the, thinking and open a few, but now we're talking about South Africa. Everybody that is in Mozambique that is seen Moreira in South Africa, they say, hey, I don't want to be close to you when you come <laughs> back. Do you understand? So it's, it's the same, but uh, uh, it, it is a huge problem. It is a huge problem, and this will prevail. So time has come for the African Union and the SADC and all these institutions to come together. We really to find a way, because mm -hmm. this is the fourth tomorrow will be the sixth, after tomorrow will be the seventh. Uh, Senegal maybe will be in June, God forbid, as maybe tomorrow. So, yeah, I want so uh, that's what I think. Interesting. And and Walter, what's the situation in Zimbabwe like? I think um, you know Zimbabwe is very much next door, you know, and so is Mozambique, Southern Africa is we're very close knit. So that's probably why you've seen that the discovery or whatever you want to call it of the new variant kind of has a blanket effect on on everybody. You know, we haven't really had any reports of um, of it being anywhere else but South Africa, but you can already see the effects that when when things are put on and, and restrictions are put on, it's 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 put on <laughs> on everybody. So like like what my brother said, I would be repeating myself because the situation is the same almost everywhere. Um, so I think we need to look at solutions that are gonna help everybody because we're not in isolation. You know, no country lives in isolation. So whatever affects Mozambique affects Zimbabwe, whatever affects Zimbabwe affects South Africa and vice versa and that kind of thing. So what we need to do now is to look at solutions that are gonna help everybody all at the same time because there's no way that we can separate ourselves and say, oh, in Zim, this is what's happening. So let's just look at solutions that help Zimbabweans only or Mozambicans only or, you know, so we, we just have to look at a co as a collective and see how we're going to live with this virus and how we can work together to make sure that we all stay in business and we all stay, you know, doing what we love to do and what, what people enjoy doing, yeah. Thank you. Um, and just maybe to give the audience and the panelists a, a, a little insight on what's happening in Tanzania. Actually, I think we are quite unique in the sense where um, throughout the whole COVID, we haven't actually had any lockdowns. We never had quarantining. And uh, other than the fact that we lost our president whilst in office, life has pretty much gone on as normal. However, in saying that, the live music industry in Tanzania is not what it used to be in the 80s, or I would say the 90s. We actually don't have much of a live music industry as such, um, but that's for different reasons and not really based on COVID. So um, just a little insight on our unique experience from the rest of the region. Um, so maybe we can go on to some leading strategies, best practices, progress, and challenges in relation to the world, uh, the road to recovery. 
um, if, if we are to call it recovery or if it's something that we are now going to have to live with. Maybe I could direct this question to Dudu um, and uh, Rishad. What was the question? The road to recovery? Yes, and uh, leading strategies, best practices, and uh, progress now that we are living with COVID. You know what? I, I have no idea what the road to recovery is, to be honest. And in terms of policy making, for me, the single most important thing is for our governments to understand that what happens in Europe is not to be copied, like literally in Africa. That for me is, if they manage to understand that, and if we manage to get that message across. In Senegal, it's a joke now, but whenever France makes a decision the same day, it's applied in Senegal. And in a way, um, it's, it, it, it makes no sense in, in whichever way you look at it. Um, I've seen markets, I mean, you're talking about Tanzania um, and life being, you know, as normal throughout the pandemic. I mean, it was pretty much the same during the day in Senegal. If you went to any marketplace, you know, it was heaving with people. Yet you couldn't have performances in clubs and restaurants. And that just doesn't make sense. So what, what, what kind of criteria is they applying to, to, to apply that shutdown? So for me, in terms of, you know, getting policymakers to get our attention, is telling them, you know, we've got a very specific kind of context. And it has to be treated as such. And I think for me, that's, that's how we can survive as an industry. It's, it's, it, and of course, you know, we suffer kind of disunity and lack of cohesion and um, representation and all the rest of it. I mean, at least in the case of Senegal, I mean, I think the, the, the community is very much divided in many ways. So to have some sort of an impactful strategy is always going to be a challenge. But for me, it's, it is the most important thing, not to, to be copycats of, you know, what, what is happening in Europe, you know, blanket solutions for everyone. And it just simply doesn't work. And the way we suffer is, is I mean, we suffer, I think we suffer probably more than, when I look at, you know, the West and the developed world and all of these supportive measures they've had in terms of grants and money that's been pumped to rescue the industry, we're nowhere near. I mean, in normal times, we, we don't have, you know, a tenth of, you know, one thousandth of the resources that they have. Mm -hmm. So why would we apply the same rules? Um, it just simply doesn't make sense. So for me, the road to recovery is having our own locally adapted measures and, and strategies. Yeah. Definitely, I think I'll echo that, and I think that's why our former president actually decided that we weren't going to have quarantine and we weren't going to have, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, lockdown. Lockdown, lockdown. yes. Yeah, sorry, because it wouldn't work for the majority of the people. People live from day to day, and um, they, it just would cause more chaos than help. Um, and mm. if I can come to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, the last point that, that uh, Dudu picked up on, that the sector, there was no business rescue at all. Uh, there was business rescue in all the other sectors of business, but except in the, in the creative industry, and that's why we almost, we're the first to, to shut down, and we're the last to open. In fact, we haven't opened up. But just in terms of you know, the transformation of it then, which was very challenging for me, you know, having to sit alone in, in my room. You've got a big TV, but you're watching a live stream. Now, first time it was, a no it was great. Second time uh, it was okay. Third time it was a novelty. Fourth time I couldn't any longer, you know. And, but you paid it because it's quite cheap as well. And it was quite good. You, everything's online in support of, of the musicians. But then if... If you really look at it, well, when you start looking back and talking to the musicians, they actually don't make money out of it. And it's interesting the kind of research being done by the, in the UK, the Musicians' Union, that the record labels make all the money and not the mu musicians. But here we, in South Africa, we also have a big challenge because data is very expensive. And, you know, for people <coughs> to access it on your phone, it's like almost impossible. So... 
The question is not how do you get back to the norm. That's the live music where you go into the venue, you smell the sweat next to you, you smell the booze, you smell the smoke, you smell the music. You know, when do we get back to that? And I think that's like a major challenge. It can be done. I think from the kind of presentation I've done and the steps might be smaller, but you know, at least we kickstart the industry again. Thank you. And uh, following on to what was actually discussed, um, which might uh, you might have to answer the same thing. Um, what are the areas of cooperation and solidarity? Um, are there any? Are there any networks of support that can support uh, the live music industry? And you can just build on that with whatever. Are there any areas of support from? From from, I mean, you tell us. Are they networks? Are they for live musicians? Is there anywhere they can go, where no. they can get help? I don't, th I don't think there's <laughs> there's help coming. <laughs> there's there's no help coming for 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 live music. You know, like what uh, Rashid said. With the last ones to, you know, with the first ones to be shut down and the last ones to be allowed to, to open up, but I think you know um, gatherings are always going to happen. People are always going to happen. We, we're in Africa, you know, where we come from, there's no way you can say there's social distancing. You can have one household where you will find there's three families living in one household. How do you social distance from that? And it's 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 not a it's not an easy thing to social distance in Africa and say, you know, everybody stay in your home and don't interact with people and that kind of thing. So it's, it's the same when it comes now to entertainment. We, we're very social beings. We're very social animals. So we need, we need to be together. We need to gather together and sing together. And, and you, 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 you will see how the Cape Town Jazz Festival affects a, a, a huge part of uh, Cape Town's creative economy, not even just the creative economy, you know, flights are full, hotels are full, uh, restaurants are full, just because the festival is happening in that in that month or that week. And the same everywhere with any 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 industry, like even now, South Africa, just because this is happening, you know, the four of us have had to fly. Actually the whole panel here had to fly. So which means that the airlines benefit the hot we're all staying in hotels. Hotels benefit. So there's huge um benefits for the economy that um, that you will see in cities, in countries, because events are happening and because festivals are happening, because live events are happening. So it can't be ignored. You can't just say, oh, you know, we're just having fun. It's not just fun. It's huge contributions to the economy. And the governments need to take serious uh, look into how we can be considered as part of solutions or look and see that, you know, uh, live ev events happen because we contribute so much into economies and how it, the ecosystem works. So we can't just say, you know what, because people are having fun, people are drinking, it's, it's, it's just that. It's, it's more than that, you know, when you look at the, the bigger picture. So help, I don't see help coming because they're not, nobody's taking us seriously and they don't think that we, you know, we need the help. And because I guess sometimes we don't make noise about it. <laughs> okay, and so... Maybe I could, you could build on what he was saying. Uh, There's no help, <laughs> no networks. No, I think the only help is us. <laughs> Let's make a decision today and shut down. No radio pays our music anyway for one week mm -hmm. in entire Africa. Then you'll see the world giving us special attention. <laughs> um, the world's population is young, 80%. Africa is no exception. Uh, he explained, yeah, my colleague, about the models used in Europe are different. My situation in Mozambique is totally different. In Maputo, I'm actually a privileged musician. I'm, I don't represent 90% of Mozambican musicians, not even South African musicians. You also know the same, mm. okay? So we are privileged. I'm not discrediting the work we do. So we have a big responsibility because there's a million years on doors creating in this last 12 years you've been working. With your festival, the same. There is a million. You Masikel has created. There's a younger generation that needs to be taken care of. And we have to accept that this situation is not going to change. It's going to evolve, change names, and et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I'm not here trying to say that I expect some sort of help, but at least that we preserve 
uh, the last thing I want to do is a phenomenal sculpture or artist that because of this situation, he sees Moreira complaining about life and he's going to work in the bank. Then you don't have a society. Mm. That's what's going to happen and it's happening as we're speaking. So I believe that maybe one thing that Europe has done well with the grants, you know, we need some sort of funding, not for live performances, but at least to preserve the ego and the spirit, to say that the spirit of the artist that, yes, better days are coming. The other thing that scares me is that, I don't know in South Africa, but in Africa, when you speak about culture, it's becoming very politicized as well. And that, that scares me, because the world is evolving in such a... Uh, velocity <laughs> with evolution of technology. Mm. Do you understand that uh, this thing of COVID? It's a fantastic excuse to reduce the speed and exposure of creativity uh, created by the expression of society and artists mm. and such. Mm. So my main wor worry now, I've, I've, I'm learning to live with this. I'm not happy, but I'm worried about. The schools that we have in South Africa, I work with many, you know, there's millions of kids, millions of kids in Mozambique and Zimbabwe that end up going and work for the customs at the borders. Do you understand? And then, and people, there were a lot of interviews, ah, Moreira, when are you doing your live stream? I've never done a live stream. I'm not interested. We record, <laughs> then we publish if we want, but I don't because of the reasons that Rashid said, but I'm really worried on the, the next generation, the kids that are 14, 16, mm -hmm. the amount of creativity that is coming, if this continues like they, top artists dying with no help, these kids are going to give up. Mm -hmm. And then, in 10 years' time, I don't know what will happen with Africa. We are not doing the Jazz Festival this year. I don't think we'll do it next year, because the priority of my partners and my sponsors is to finance the sins. But now you're saying you got vaccinated. But now you're saying that someone who got the two doses or one is back sick or died. So mm. I think the future yeah. is in the next generation. Sorry. No, no. I mean, what you're saying is very important. And I think you touched upon, you know, the fact that you're not interested in, in doing anything digital. And maybe that's something that we can discuss. I mean, are they If digital? it's sponsored and paid up front. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yes. So what are the digital opportunities and, and does it work? Well, for Africa, it's, it's, it's tricky because not everybody's got access to data, you know. Mm -hmm. The privileged few, like what Moreira said, there are certain people that are privileged. So there are people that are privileged that can watch things online, but it's not everybody that has got access to, um, to, to data or cheap data for, the, for that matter. So in Zimbabwe... It's not everybody that has got access to internet. Yes, they've got phones, they've got smartphones, but they only use their smartphones maybe for just WhatsApp, but not necessarily for them to be able to stream a, a one-hour concert. But, you know, what we know with live music is the, the, the enjoyment comes from you being around other people, like you said, the smell of, you know, sweat with the guy next to you, the enjoyment, the... The noise, the you know that that is what you enjoy. So that's that's the the magic that comes out of live music. It's not necessarily the fact that you're sitting in your house on your couch, watching it on a big screen. It's different. So digital, yeah, it works. We possibly need to have a situation where we include digital on top of live, so that it becomes hybrid, mm. and someone actually has a choice. So when you take away choice from people. It, it, you know, no human being wants their choices taken away. You want to have a choice to say, okay, I'm going to watch the show or I'm not going to go watch the show. Mm -hmm. If I want to go, do I go and watch it live or do I watch it at home on my phone or on my TV? So at least let's work at a situation where we can give people the power to choose. But at the moment, we're not giving people the power to choose. We're just saying digital. Mm -hmm. But the digital also segregates a lot of people that don't have access to, to data. But, you know, so let's have a situation where everybody has a choice to be able to watch live, to be able to watch digitally. And maybe even digital, it needs to be free. So, but are we going to have telecom companies that are going to zero rate data on, on people that are watching? No, we're not. But if we say telecoms, everybody who's got access to a smartphone, they can watch without paying for data. That may work but we're not going to see that because they're in business and so are we. 
So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a big debate, but choice needs to happen. There has to be a, a situation where people choose. Rashid and Dudu, do you have any any thoughts and feelings about the digital world? Well, I I always say to my younger brothers and sisters that I'm I'm still I'm analog, not digital. So <laughs> <laughs> that's my claim to yeah, I'm analog. And I'm trying to kind of foray into that digital world, but I'm struggling, man. I'm analog. And my experience is in the live music industry. For me, it's, you know, a band and their fans, you know, and that communion. That's where I get my kick from. Having said that, you know, when I looked at the staggering figures of BTS, the Korean pop group, you know, raking in over, what, $20 million from their stream, where they had 300,000 you know, fans around 66 countries in the world. And I thought, wow, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that opens up a whole realm of possibilities. Um, I'd love to see Burner Boy kind of achieve those numbers, or for that matter, any of these young fans. But the same issues that Walter mentioned, you know, access to data, how expensive it is. And, of course, our consumption habits. I mean, we're very social beings in, on the continent. And I think, you know... Um, Watch that space. It's interesting mm. stuff, but you know, I still prefer to remain analog. To be honest, so can't wait but to be back on stage. Yep, two of us there. Eh? Yep, definitely. Me too. Uh, can't meet in it. <laughs> you're, you're analog as well. <laughs> Don't tell me. I'm seeing you download icon. <laughs> Send me a you know, hard copy. Yeah. But I think you know. I mean, personally, maybe I'm I'm just prejudiced, which have been a lot of things. Of issues around social issues, but sorry, um, Rashid. They, before I forget this, yeah. I mean, I remember when you know the streaming. I mean, download came about. I saw this sign said, "You can you you can experience a download, but you can't download an experience." Which no. I thought, yeah. okay, you know, so it's, but is one of my favorite saying. And you can't download the live experience for me. I mean, you have to be there. That's it. Yeah. No. So, so yeah, on on the streaming, I mean, I'm being prejudiced, but maybe maybe even in the audience. There's musicians that had a decent income. Uh, certainly the musicians I know, which uh, I communicate with, uh, in, South, in South Africa have, haven't made a decent living. I only know of one comedian that had 80,000 uh, viewers at 100 rand a pop, which is a decent. But there are obviously those big names that, that will draw a, a million. But you know, I don't know even the audience, if it's any musician that made... You know, like any any perhaps younger five thousand. <laughs> Excuse me, I just want to add something. Again, we go back to the social dynamics of our continent. Mm -hmm. You add this comedian with eighty thousand viewers, mm -hmm. and he makes some cash. Okay, you spoke about the South Korean band. I just came back from South Korea. Mm -hmm. Do you know why they achieved those numbers? Number one, because they're exposed. People are there, but the regulation is in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, ah. the money. When, eh? mm -hmm. when you click into that, when you play into that, the money is shifted to the right places. Mm -hmm. If you come to Mozambique, yes. I'm registered with Samur. It's not a lie. My recording label is in South Africa. My mm -hmm. music is played in Mozambique, but I don't get royalties from Mozambique. Mm -hmm. So then we come to a sex and subject. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say, all the things that we delay in life... Life is not waiting for us, it's moving. Now we have a situation with COVID mm. where we have to go digital. I don't know how it is in Zimbabwe, mm. you know? I know the late Tuku was a good friend of mine. We, we had him in Mozambique, but I don't know if you get his royalties from Mozambique. I don't think, I don't believe. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So then comes a second subject matter. Mm. So that's why I believe on insisting on investment. We have to stop looking at what we're doing with funds. We don't need funds. We need investors that come and believe in your festival and partner with you mm -hmm. and invest. Like they invest in oil and gas and coal. We need investors. Yeah. So then we start doing uh, like a long-term project. Because when you look at art, music, you look at the short term. Oh, you just want to do a show in a museum. No, there's a career here. There is a process of creativity. Mm -hmm. There's licensing, okay? There's many things involved. In th so that's a big challenge. In Mozambique, we have amazing artists. You can go online. I'm not going to mention, otherwise they'll say we're promoting. With big followers, big numbers. But trust me, the income doesn't come from that. Yeah. Conversion. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think um, from 
I can speak personally from my experience when I used to play on stage to a live audience before management and, and, and production is the one thing that we mustn't forget that, yes, we're talking about benefits for the fans and benefits from those that put up the shows, which is us. But there's something that has been taken away from artists, the experience that they get from them presenting their work to a live audience. Mm. So I think we focus on how this whole thing has affected us. Yeah. And we focus on how this whole thing has affected the audience. But I think not a lot is being spoken about on how it's affected what has been taken away from the artist. What you're talking is happening in tennis and everywhere. Yeah. Mental. Yes. Mentally. So, <laughs> and, 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 and what has been taken from the artist is an opportunity for them to present their heart to people. And that happens live. You don't, they don't feel that from performing in front of cameras. Mm -hmm. So, and I think any artist that, I mean, it's, it's sad to hear that Big Brother he also hasn't performed in two years. He must be dying inside because he gets life from, you know, seeing people enjoying themselves, seeing people dancing to his music, seeing people cry, seeing people happy. You know what I mean? And I think any artist, if you ask any artist that performs in front of people, that is more payment than any amount of money, any amount of clicks that they can get. But to be able to interact with people that are accepting the gift of music that they would have been represented. And I think that's something that we also need to look at and say, hey, you know what, let's, let's consider the musicians and what they have lost. Because yes, they get paid eventually and, and, and. But I think a lot of musicians have gone through a lot of depression and a lot of, uh, it's not even just income that they've lost. They've lost their lives. They've lost, you know, most of these people can't communicate verbally, but their best way of communication is through their instruments, through their music, through expressing themselves. And, and that has been taken away, and they have no way of expressing themselves now, mm -hmm. and they have no way of, of, of sharing their hearts to people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, that we need to consider as well, that yeah. you know, it's, it's a huge part of, mm -hmm. uh, of the whole thing. And it's, it's actually the last part. Nobody ever thinks of what we've taken away from the artists, but you know. I, I just thought that it's something that, that we also need to look and, and consider and see how best we can we can help artists as well in that regard. Thank you, Walter. Did you have any, before we open the forum up for people to ask questions, because I wanted to allow more time for that, because yeah. usually we never have enough time for that. That's did true. you have any other, any other thoughts on this subject of artists and their mental health? Um, thank you. You're a genius, Walter, because... I've been negotiating with an office in Paris for the past 10 years to bring your soul to Mozambique. And it's a woman, I won't mention her name. So I have a gig in the pocket for you, so for 10 years. And, and uh, Is that Michelle? <laughs> like yeah, like a Zell, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a business, so I'm straightforward. So, and like a Zell, whatever. So we'll talk. Thank I'm you. here, bro. Walter, so Walter we, 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 I love yeah. you, brother. Thank you. So I have the gig for you, so. Uh, yeah. should, should we? Do you have any? Yeah, no, let's, yeah. let's go to we, the floor. Could we bring in some questions? We have an opportunity to speak to some key industry players here. Any questions from the audience? Should I just have to? Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm James from, from Angola. And uh, yes, uh, I'm also old school like you guys, but there is a positive side and takeaway from this whole situation. I think we should bring that, that positive side in. Of course, it's hard for many artists. It's a very similar situation to, to Mozambique in Angola. But yes, uh, the other side of it, a lot of artists are going online, maybe not making money, but reaching out to, to new audiences. And Angola, like most of Africa, is like 50% is under 26 or 27 years old. And they're exploring a lot and they're learning a lot by the internet connections and by the, the, the live music going on. And also there's 
<coughs> other sides of new, new networks being created. My brother Teshoma, who's here, uh, recently launched another network, Pan-African network. Um, Teshoma is from Ethiopia and Sweden. And I would love to hear more about that. There's also Cultural Connections Africa, which some of you guys and I am part of. So there, there are various projects, and there's also <clears throat> in the in progress to to be launched a way of getting free internet to all of Africa, Asia, and, and Latin America. So there are positive sides. We shouldn't dismiss them. Thank you. Any more questions? Could somebody help me with the mic yeah, down here? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, Walter, I just organized a tour with a South African artist in Europe and we played six shows, but how many digital concerts could we play? We can play one, but it, it's not effective. It's one drop on a hot stone. It disappears, but when you play, you can play six shows, you can play ten shows, and yeah, the artists need that. I've seen it, I've been there right now, and the look in their eyes and just the whole, it, it, was, it, it was incredible. And Yes, there is initiatives for live and streaming, but it's not replacing the live, and it's really like, it's actually a joke, to be honest. And it's, as I say, how many live streaming concerts can you pay, and then you get paid, what, for a funding 200 bucks for 200 euros for, for this live stream, you walk in a studio, there's not the same energy and the vibe, it's okay, and you get footage out of it, which I think is the biggest benefit, to be honest, out of a live stream, because you have recorded material for the future. But um, I don't think it replaces it, and it's a, it's a problem, you know. And the only thing I see with the online digital is to go into new kind of directions, markets, work with the gaming industry, come up with new ideas, things like this. But, yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Yusuf from yeah. Saudi Abu Sara, from Tanzania. <laughs> Oh, somebody Guys, a round of applause for this man. I think he said, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, thank you, Aziza, for bringing to our attention the fact that across the African continent, Tanzania has been somewhat blessed in terms of being able to live somewhat as normal over the last 18 months. Um, I think I really appreciate all the comments made by the panelists. Uh, on issues, and I, I, I heartily strengthen the, the 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 sentiment that life, live music must go on. Mm -hmm. Live music yeah. must go on, and despite all the challenges, and as promoters, um, we have to um, understand that this situation is here, and we have to provide safe environments for life live music to go on in collaboration with the health authorities and the other government authorities that are relevant to make sure that live music can continue. And in that respect, we need African leaders to be more independent and more bold in their thinking. And just as an example, in um, February 2021, Saud Zabusara 18th edition went ahead in Zanzibar. It, would, it was a decision that was a very tough one. And, and it took several months of thinking, shall we cancel, should we go ahead? Should we cancel, should we go ahead? Many of the artists who were confirmed had unfortunately to cancel at last minute because of travel regulations and restrictions and COVID-19. So it was challenging in terms of having to find last minute acts to replace them. We had a lot of exp extra expenses for, um, you know, sanita sanitizing, sanitizing, PCR tests and health procedures and safety arrangements. We had a lot of other challenges, but I think the most challenging of all was one week before the festival when we all already built the stages and the equipment was flying in and you know, the, the festival is almost about to happen. We had a, a letter received 
signed by the ambassador of the European Union, co-signed by the ambassador of Netherlands, co-signed by the ambassador of Norway, co-signed by the ambassador of France, the ambassador of Ireland and somewhere else, saying, we beg you to postpone this festival. <laughs> Do not go ahead because of the COVID situation. So, of course, we spoke with our leaders, our Tanzanian leaders in the ministries, the immigration, the health, the president's office, and they all said, no, we don't have a lockdown in Tanzania. People are gathering in football stadiums and entertainment venues and mosques and churches and so on. We are very happy if the festival goes ahead. It's important for our economy, for our jobs, for our livelihoods. So we went ahead. But almost every half an hour for that last week, there were European ambassadors calling us saying, we, why haven't you responded to our letter? Why haven't you, why haven't you, are you really going ahead? Blah, 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 blah. And thankfully, we thank God, a week after the festival, two weeks after the festival, after consulting all the clinics, the hospitals, there was no spike. People had got jobs. People had promoted them, their music. You know, um, we had training and, and they, yeah, thank God it went ahead and we plan to go ahead in February 2022 and hope yeah. to see lots yeah. of people well there. <laughs> thank you, that that is, so. That's the way. That's the way. That, that, is, that is actually very worrying <laughs> that they were getting, uh, they got a letter from different embassies to try and persuade them to stop. It makes you wonder, in, in the other countries where the governments are not as, um, you know, steadfast about wanting to do what they want to do, how many governments give in based on influence that comes from, you know, Outside. from mm -hmm. embassies. So we, we may possibly see that the rest of Africa is, is, is not doing what Tanzania is doing, basically, not because of the sovereignty of their own decision to 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 say we're going to go this way, but possibly from other people that are influencing those governments to. That's quite interesting. That you you know you point out that that that's what happened. Our own governments are they making their own decisions? I don't know. Yeah, that's very interesting, and um, maybe we won't get too much into the political side of that. Sure. But yeah, Dudu, you had something to add. No, I'd like to hear more from the audience. I, I, I think it's... Hi there. Um, may I hear the now? Thank you so much. Um, my name is Matt Marilak. I am from the African Leadership Academy. Um, interestingly, you know, we, we recently launched an um, arts network for all our alumni. Um, so I share the concern um, that Morera... Um, forgive me for pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, I'm a member, by the way. Really? We should member. chat. Oh, my word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Indeed, yeah. no, I'd love to connect with you. Um, I share your concern about the future of the industry and um, the choices young people are forced to make in this time. Um, these young people being artists um, at heart, creative, creatives at heart, um, but because of the economic pressures of what's happening to the creative industries are now forced to choose different careers. And um, I guess on the one hand, I'm, I'm seeing that pressure being very real. Um, but I am also not necessarily seeing um, any kind of initiatives that continue to capture the minds of young people to choose this kind of career. Um, because I am worried again about, in 10 years' time, what will the creative industries look like when we've lost um, a tremendous amount of um, capacity, right? Coming through the music schools, coming through the universities, choosing film, choosing music, choosing all of these things. So I'd love to hear some more thoughts around um, how do we prevent that from happening? Um, and um, how do we also... I, I, and I do understand that I'm in, in the presence of uh, analog enthusiasts, <laughs> but um, within, within uh, the, the opportunities that digital allows, how do we pivot to, to 
allow, perhaps even if we can't see beyond analog, how do we allow the young people coming up that do have a different perspective to choose um, those pathways? That gentleman has had his hand up throughout. He was probably the first one with his hand oh, okay. up. Okay, is he yeah. all the way up there? Yeah. Can somebody get get in the mic? Let me. Oh, he's got one. Okay. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, thank Good morning. you, Dudu, for noticing me. I've been <laughs> raising my hand for a long time. <laughs> my name is Johnny Muteba. I'm from the Pan African Chamber of Commerce. I'm an artist. I've been in the art for about 20 years now. We've had these conversations over and over and over, where we are just talking about the problems. Whatever you focus your attention on actually is amplified. We've been part of these conversations from Mushito in South Africa here from as far back as 2006. When are we as Africans going to change the conversation about the future that we see? I'm here with my daughter, and when we speak about the problems and the problems and the problems, before COVID, we had this conversation. I am saying this basically because as Africans, we love working alone. I left the arts six years ago because there was nothing for me. I'm back in the arts now, and next year, God willing, we are going to be organizing the Pan-African Music Award in Durban. That would have been our third edition. We are coming from all over the continent to convene here. And we see music having this conversation. We see film having this conversation. We see fashion having this conversation. I have just one question, and of course I will finish. What do you think is the role of the African diaspora in this conversation when it comes to celebrating and promoting African culture? I'm an African. <coughs> I'm from the DRC. I've been here for about 20 years. But I have to leave Africa for the work that I do to be appreciated. I've set up a chamber of commerce now in the US. In one year, the American Art Chamber of Commerce I've set up has achieved so much more than the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce I set up in South Africa six years ago. The question to all of you sitting over there, I know basically everyone there. Are we really being serious about the investment in the growth and the development of the sector if we are going to have the conversations amongst ourselves, just as, as, as musicians? We, we don't see uh, government people here. We don't see companies. I'm not talking about MTN and Standard Bank. I'm talking about entrepreneurs, basically. I see the African Leadership Academy here. You have a, an amazing leader who set up now this university. The ecosystem mindset, when are we going to start working that out as far as music is concerned, so that music is intentionally engaging with film? A month ago, we worked on a project, a fashion exchange between South Africa and Italy. And I was saying to the Italian ambassador, why are we talking about I mean, fashion alone without film? Why? And I did remind him that there is a film <laughs> called the devil wears Prada. So you can see the marriage of fashion and film there. Are we really going to start thinking just like this, continuing to have the conversations, just music with music and musicians and people in the ecosystem without involving the private sector? One last thing I want to say, the Pan-African Chamber that I've been leading for six years now has what we call the African Agenda for Culture. This African Agenda for Culture positions African culture at the heart of economic development in Africa, but also connecting Africa to the diaspora. We have seven pillars there. We have access, we have advocacy, we've got export, exchange, um, we've got investment in infrastructure. But there is education at the center of all of that. There is, there is the African Leadership Academy here. We are really going to make a difference as a continent when we stop thinking in silos. I'm an artist. I'm a founder of Chambers of Commerce. And I see the interest that many people are showing for the continent. Why is it that there is no film part of this conversation? Why is it that there's no fashion as part of this conversation? 
We just came from Canex now in Durban at the Intra-Africa Trade Fair. This is going to be the same 10 years from now, 20 years from now. The same conversations, those who are old today, unfortunately, can die tomorrow. How do we say to these young people, here's a BTS fan sitting next to me. When, when BTS was being mentioned there, she looked at me. Um, <laughs> how, do we, how do we build our own BTS, but at the same time work as a collective? I, I don't want to speak like repeating mm -hmm. myself. Let me stop there. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank yeah. you so much for your question. Um, um, yeah, if I may just jump in. I think, I mean, in French we say la répétition est pédagogique. Um, if the brother's still listening to the answers to his question, I think he's laughing away. Have I got your attention now? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, no, it, I, I started off because you're from the RC. I started off by answering in French. Um, and they say, la répétition est pédagogique. So repetition is pedagogical. Um, Yes, we've been saying the same thing because we need to say the same thing. That doesn't mean we haven't made progress. Yeah. Each one of us here mm -hmm. has his own venture, and that's a step towards improving that ecosystem that you're talking about. And I think we're all vested in improving the ecosystem. I came back from 25 years in London with one intention in mind, which was to start a music conference and a festival in Senegal to improve. Because... You know, looking at African music being present, I mean, most of the concerts presenting African music at the time were outside of Africa. I mean, well, not statistically correct, but when you look at money earned, especially in the world music kind of era, it was through festivals outside of the continent. So we all have the same assessment and we're all taking steps towards finding solutions. I think, yes, we need to ramp up those efforts and of course the public sector and the leaders have got to come on board and I think all of us are trying that at least in my in Senegal I'm always trying to engage with policy makers the leadership so we're, we're doing that bro we, we are on it every day every day of this so don't don't get don't get mistaken we're 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 dealing with the same topics because we need to carry on talking about it and we need to continue the you know, the, the, I, I was going to say the fight or the struggle. It's not a fight, but we're all entrepreneurs and we know it has to come from us entrepreneurs and the solutions lie in our hands and we're busy doing that. Uh, just to add, I forgot your name, Sava. <laughs> just to tell you that uh, before I go to any place, I find out who is there, okay? And uh, I know Rashid, so I'm biased. I don't know Rashid as a producer, director, founder of Cape Town International. No, I know Rashid as a photographer. So it's part of the creative industry that you're talking. You don't see fashion. You don't see et cetera, et cetera. So myself, I'm a saxophonist, but I'm an ethnomusicologist. But now you brought that you are the president of the Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, et cetera, which is great. I'm the president of the sector for creative industries and culture in Mozambique that represent all the entrepreneurs associated to this, okay? So I'm not here talking as a saxophone player, as a musician. I just wanted to, and we can talk further later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, th I think to, to kind of echo what my two brothers have said, it's, it's important that um, we continue with discussions. It may sound like we're repeating the same thing, but it's always true that you need to, you know, when, when music in Africa say we've got access, we've got these people coming and they, these people speaking, it's, it's important that you don't see them in the one possible office that, or hat that they're wearing at that current time because we all wear different hats depending on what, what, what is the topic of discussion. So my history as well is from a, a perspective of me as a musician, as a, as a, as a guitarist and also in, in IT and film. So I'm also not here just talking about music because of one facet that, that, that maybe is what we're talking about. So if you ask me, can we, Walter, tell us about you, I'm gonna tell you about what's relevant to this platform. But there may be other things that I'm also involved with. So when we discuss and when we do whatever we're gonna do, we then, I can then contribute based on the fact that I also may have 
interest in mm -hmm. something that may not have been highlighted as being something that I have interest in. But I think it's important that you also, what I, I love about what the brother has done is he's brought his daughter with him. And I think shout out to you for that, for, you know, for, for, exposing, for exposing your daughter to, 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 to this. I think that's, that's really important. At least we know that the future is, is bright and then you know, you're doing everything you can to make sure that she's, she's getting the knowledge and, and exposure that she needs. So you know, well done for, you, for, that, for doing that. Can I, yes, can I please. Just, 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 I think what, what I want to explore further is just new regained interest in the creative industries in Africa, I mean, you came from Canex, you said, and Africa Exim Bank has been announced this, 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 this $500 million that they're going to be pumping into the creative sector. And then all of a sudden, I see the IFC in, in, um, had a um, panel discussion, the head of the IFC. Next week, or in a couple of weeks, the Organisation de la Francophonie is also going to have. So all of a sudden, they, they all thought to themselves, oh, yeah, <laughs> let's spend, let's get some money into the creative sector in Africa. For what reason? We don't know when we've been saying that all along. I think what we need to focus on now is where is that money going to go and how is it going to be spent in the creative sector? Yeah, I think that's where the coalition of, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I think we have gone over time, so... Um, is there any one more pending question? Thank you. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Larissa. I'm from Believe Music. I represent editorial marketing partnerships for um, our African clients, producers, and artists. I'm actually sitting here with my colleague Davey, who is the label manager from Cameroon. He takes care of many of our francophone-based artists and uh, independent record labels that we partner with. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to thank the panelists and uh, other speakers in the audience who have raised the different challenges uh, that live music has been facing uh, for African artists, especially independent artists who are not represented by traditional record labels. Um, you know, personally speaking, I'm also um, a lover of live music, um, even though uh, I work in the digital distribution space. Uh, my question to our panelists today is, Given what we have discussed and given the different challenges raised, especially with live streaming and ensuring that artists earn those revenues, what would you like to see from your record labels, digital distributors and the digital music and content platforms that you think is missing uh, for the independent artists to actually earn those revenues? What would you like them to be doing more of? It's a good question. Does anyone want to jump in to that? Rashid? For, for, for me, um, I would love, it's not even what you're providing, it's what pressure you can exert, especially in the francophone um, zone, it's what pressure we can exert on Orange to make things easier. Because there's, you know, we, could, we can build, we can have all the strategies, all the tools, if access to data is still as expensive as it is, you know, there's no point. So for me, I think we, uh, you know, concerted action onto some of the telco operators and what they're doing in the content is just not right, especially in the francophone sector. So for me, for Believe and Universe and all these, they should be talking to these telco operators. I think that's where, for me, you know, the, 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 the solution lies in the future for, you know, access to data and, um, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to repeat, but coming from Mozambique, um, I have a contract, right? So sometimes when they, you have a contract 15 years ago, it's like you're high in life because the guy used a prepaid, right? And I'm about to change to the prepaid <laughs> because the guys with the prepaid, they get more benefits than me that I have a contract yeah. through my company because my... I use three days and my dad is gone, so I can't do anything. So regarding the recording label, I'm the wrong person to talk. Why? Because I'm an indie. My business partner is there, Leslie Wells. We own More Star Entertainment, and we've spoken before. I went solo. Seven albums today. Last one with Manu Dibango, mm -hmm. independent, because we can talk outside. Because 
I'm independent, so I think I'm with you. So we should, it's, I don't, I don't even know how to spell universal, but anyway. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I just signed with that, but hey. Yeah, I'm, I think. I'm a distribution the, deal. Yeah. <laughs> we just did, yeah. <laughs> the, the, I think the power in, in digital uh, distribution is obviously in reach. And as long as people are not don't have access to to the to the to the content, then you're not selling to anybody. So yeah. if you if you're performing to no one, and you've got you've got your digital content on every platform in the world, and nobody has got access to it, then there's no value in the content. Which goes back to what my brother has just said that access to to the content is what's key. So it's not necessarily what you guys can do to help the artists. We need to get people access to the content in the first place. And that's why television and analog, as, you may, you may, as people may look down on it, that's why it made sense. Because then when music was being played on TV, all the people needed to have was the television set in their home. And, you know, uh, you know, and back then, the talk was about electricity to get power into the house so that the TV goes on and then they can watch it but now it's no longer about electricity it's, it's more about how do they access data onto their device so that people can watch so it, it definitely goes back to the telecoms and I think governments should they didn't see how important data was going to be to today and they allowed private sector to have such a hold on 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 data now you know the telecoms are the ones that have the power because they control the information that goes out to the masses. It's not just music anymore. It's just information on its own. So it, access to data should have been something that possibly, <laughs> I don't know if it would have been a good thing, but it would have been something that maybe possibly is something that is given to as many people as possible in as little money as, you know, subsidized extremely. Then we can then talk about how the artists can make money and how you guys can come into to the party because then yeah. people have have got access to it. Absolutely. So it's 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 got to do with a lot of the telecoms and and what they can do. When the masses have the content, then we can talk about the income. Thank you, Walter. I'm so sorry. We're gonna have to cut it short. We've gone way over time, but I would like to say thank you to all of you guys here for sharing your time and experience. Just maybe um, as a general closing speech to say that. Uh, we actually need, I know individually, we are all working to engage more younger people in this space and also more women in this space and people from more marginalized communities. Um,